Good morning from Haskell Hall at the Episcopal Church of the Redeemer in Ruston, Louisiana in the United States. This is session five uh, and we've got about three more, two or three more. Um, this uh, group of sessions is centered around the Nicene Creed and more so around the Apostles' Creed. And so uh, we're taught, we're, you know, we started with I believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, etc. We had two sessions on Jesus. And uh, now we are in I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then next week we will do We Believe in One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So that will be more about our theology of the church. Um, so today we're dealing with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, we may say a little bit about the Trinity. Well, to get going, the first thing that you have to do when you deal with, you know, the Holy Spirit, you have to deal with what happens when a person becomes a Christian. And, um, and then we will deal with the Holy Spirit and ministries in the church. We believe we are in a, a church that says all of the members are ministers. How about that? And then I will talk at the end about renewal movements. I have a particular opinion about renewal movements, and I'll tell you my opinion about renewal movements, um, et cetera. Uh, so we sort of have a three-part session. Uh, what happens when you and I become a Christian? Well, if you look at the uh, right one of the Eucharist, uh, there is a confession of sin in right one. There's also one in right two. But here is the one in right one, and that is where you have the these and the vows. And I realize that most Episcopal churches are not using the these and the vows these days. But nonetheless, with the these and the vows, it says this, we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. And it goes, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life through the same Christ our Lord. And so, when you become a Christian, tradition has it that you become aware of the fact that you, as well as I, as well as everybody else, are sinners. And so we all have the experience of being a sinner being unworthy to be in the presence of a holy God. And uh, remember uh, the call narrative of Isaiah, where Isaiah is called to be a prophet, um, where uh, Almighty God is sitting on the throne and his train fills the temple. And uh, eventually he says, who, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Note the interchange between the singular and the plural. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Um, and eventually, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then what happens, first of all, Isaiah says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen Yahweh, the God of hosts. And therefore, the, the, the um, angel comes with a live coal from the altar and it touches his mouth. Remember, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And so the coal touches his mouth and God says, your sin is purged, right? And so God has the ability to forgive sins and you need to have your sins forgiven to be in the presence of the Holy God. And if you read the latter part of, the cha of, the latter part of chapter seven of Romans, you would uh, read about St. Paul and the question is, is St. Paul speaking autobiographically? I have argued that he's not. My teacher argued that he is. And anyway, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will, be, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Um, and then it ends, that chapter ends by saying, but thanks be to God through, our, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so uh, we are sinful human beings. And if we get our sins forgiven, it's because God has provided a way out of the mess that we have caused through our disobedience to God. If you read Romans 5, it says Christ, um, at the right time, God 
uh, sent his son and Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And they're all, that's all about, well, that's all through Romans 5 is the death of Christ as an atonement for our sins. And so the way out of the mess that we human beings have caused leads us through the death of Christ for our sins as well as through Christ's resurrection. And the first 11 verses of Romans 6 is all about uh, we are co-buried with Christ in baptism. And then as Christ is raised, um, as Christ is raised, in other words, you come up out of the water, I guess, as Christ is raised from death, we too may walk in newness of life. So death and resurrection, um, which was Christ, is likened to going in and out of the water of baptism. And then later, it's all about being buried because of sin. And then after one's sins having been forgiven, being able to walk in newness of life. And then the Romans 8, at the very end of Romans 8, it's all about the courtroom scene where um, it's a last judgment scene and it's a courtroom scene and the prosecuting attorney doesn't even show up because God the Father has already described the case, has already decided the case. If God be for us, who can be against us? And the understanding, understood answer is no one. And uh, Christ is our advocate. Uh, the prosecuting attorney doesn't even show up. And so the courtroom scene at the end of Romans 8 is all about um, the forgiveness of sins leading to salvation. So the question is how this relates to the Holy Spirit. So, well, it all goes back to creation and it all goes back to salvation and redemption. Uh, you'll, you, we are all familiar from Ash Wednesday with Psalm 51. Um, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. And in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is synonymous with God. It is the same thing as God. And uh, so that's a very important in insight. Also in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, the Spirit of God brooded over the face of the waters. So the Spirit of God, or a wind from God, if you think the NRSV is right on this point, a wind from God blew over the waters, but traditionally it was the Spirit of God. Ruach either means spirit or wind or breath. Anyway, um, so at the beginning of creation, God was there, and God in the Hebrew Bible, which is the term we prefer for the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit, and that is synonymous with God. Um, also, in the second creation story, um, Adam, Adam, um, is given the breath of life, and God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam, and he became a living nephesh. Uh, he became a living human being because God gave him the breath of life, and uh, ruach, you know, breath, spirit. So when you're breathing, you're living right? Um, and then there's more about the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. And then uh, the risen Christ. Um, by the way, there used to be a, a few Episcopalians that didn't like the peace. Um, I served in a church in Columbus, Georgia, and at the early service, we did right one, I think, and this woman would get down in the pew like this, and so that no one would dare to exchange the peace with her, okay? Um, in any event, if you think the peace is, is no damn good, then you ought to read John 20, because what does the risen Christ say to the disciples? Peace be with you. And then it says, he breathed on them, and, the, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the breath that Jesus has, kind of like God in the book of Genesis, uh, the breath that Jesus had when Jesus breathed on the apostles, he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit 
has always been there, both in the Hebrew Bible uh, and in the New Testament. And of course, lots and lots about the, the uh, Holy Spirit in Romans 8, especially. Also in Galatians, uh, Paul says, well, of course you're Christians. You don't need to be circumcised. Of course you're Christians. You were baptized and you received the Holy Spirit, of course. And so uh, it's synonymous with being a Christian that you've received the Holy Spirit. Tell your Pentecostal and charismatic friends that. Uh, becoming a Christian means you receive the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is a normative part of being a member of the body of Christ, uh, to be a member of the people of God who are redeemed by Christ. And that is why the Holy Spirit is not the private possession of a particularly few holy people, but rather is God's gift to the church as a whole, right? And you can read the narrative in Acts 2 where the Holy Spirit was given to the whole group of disciples, not, by the way, just to the apostles. So you think when we pass this peace that we are disseminating the voice of, of God with the Holy Spirit again? As, as, Christians, as Christians who are baptized, we have already received the Holy Spirit. Okay. What Jesus did, they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit, and so after he greeted them with the greeting of Shalom, peace be with you, he said, ah, receive the Holy Spirit. So, uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the risen Christ is the one who um, gave the greeting of peace to his apostles. So if it's good enough for Jesus to do, it's good enough for us to do. By the way, the peace was always there. It was that Thomas Cranmer, maybe it was his secret wife, but Thomas Cranmer is the one that took it out. And he put it in at the beginning of the service, at the end of the service, because the blessing at the end of the service is, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And so he put the peace effectively in the blessing at the end, rather than the peace um, as part of the liturgy, but the peace had, al had always been there in the medieval church. Cranmer just kind of took it out and put it in where he thought it was convenient. And I'd say he screwed up. And qu please quote me, <laughs> all right, um, to your evangelical Anglican friends. Anyway, um, your, the Holy Spirit is involved in ministries in the church. And if you read 1 Corinthians 12, You'll hear about all different ministries in the church. Apostles, prophets, pastors and teachers, people who serve in one way or the other. You'll see that in 1 Corinthians 12. You'll see it in Ephesians 4. And the question is, what do you think that the two texts tell us about ministries in the church? It means that this prayer book has got it right where it says, who are the ministers of the church? The ministers of the church are laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons. Laypersons are mentioned first, see? And so then there are other ways of understanding ministry. After Paul's death, the pastoral epistles were written, and particularly 1 Timothy and Titus have replaced that charismatic giving of spiritual gifts to apostles, prophets, pastors and teachers, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's been replaced in 1 Timothy by, the apostles are dead by that time, bishops, one bishop per church, rather than multiple bishops, as in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. one bishop per church, presbyters, uh, people like me, and then deacons, and then in 1 Timothy, widows, who are on the payroll of the church, and the writer of 1 Timothy does not like that idea. But nonetheless, what was originally in Paul is apostles, Paul being one of them, pastors and apostles, prophets, pastors and teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long list of them. And that's replaced after Paul's death with the bishop of the city, the presbyters in the church, and then deacons, and then, according to 1 Timothy, widows as well. So over time, the ways that ministries have been, have been done in the church has oftentimes changed as society has changed, um, one of the big changes originally in the church, uh, the, the bishop was the only one who presided at the Eucharist because the bishop was the senior pastor of the church in the city. 
As the church grew, especially after the Edict of Milan in 313, where it became legal to be a Christian, then there grew to be, the bishop grew to be no longer the senior pastor of a single church, but he grew to be sort of the regional senior pastor. But that meant the bishop could not be in every church every Sunday, nor do every baptism. And so they, they made it possible for the, the priests, the presbyter, to be the celebrant of the Eucharist and for the celebrant of the, Eucharist, of the baptism to normatively be the presbyter, the, the priest. And then later in the West, those who had been baptized by the priests could be brought to the bishop and the bishop would lay hands on them. And they did that in the West, but in the East, the, the priests, were, the local priests, were given the permission to do all of Christian initiation, whereas in the West, the bishops reserved confirmation for themselves. So in any event, ministries change, liturgies change, many things change as the history of the church goes on, and especially as society changes. And so, given that the fact that the New Testament tells us about a wide variety of ministries of service and leadership in the church, what should we do with the erroneous idea that only priests and bishops are real ministers? I think that we need to toss that out and put it in the trash can. Don't even put it in the compost heap. Uh, toss it out. Um, and I think, I think what we're experiencing now at Redeemer is, um, given that we don't have a full-time priest but only a broken down retired priest, um, the vestry and other people are doing a lot more ministry than, than perhaps they would do if you had a full-time priest. So I think that's all to the good. And of course, then, if you, if you really believe that people who are not ordained, just, shall we say, regular people in the church who take their baptism seriously, what should we be doing in the church about training people for these different ministries in the church. Because in the catechism it says, who are the ministers of the church? And the answer is, the ministers of the church are laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons. And so, if that's true, all the, all the members of the church are ministers of the church, then that means that churches, local churches, and regional groupings of churches should be in the business of training people to do various ministries in the church. And um, to the extent that we're not, um, that's problematic. Um, by the way, there's all sorts of renewal movements in the church. And renewal movements have been around since the time of John the Baptist in the first century. Um, John the Baptist and Jesus probably thought, clearly, Sir, clearly John the Baptist thought, and Jesus probably thought, that they were heading up renewal movements within Judaism. They always saw themselves as being Jews, right? And they thought that they were heading up a slightly different way of doing, practicing Judaism. And therefore, their ministries were directed primarily at Jews. Um, if you don't believe that Jesus felt that way, read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so within the history of Anglicanism, there have been several very famous renewal movements. The most famous of all being in the 18th century, which may have been the low point in the history of Christianity. Uh, but in the 18th century, this priest with an Oxford education headed up a renewal movement within Anglicanism that was referred to as the Holy Society, and you had to follow the method in order to practice your Christianity in this Holy Society the right way. And so that's why the followers of John Wesley, who never left the Church of England. I love to tell Methodists that. Right. Well, however, he did ordain, he did, however, ordain elders for the United, for America, which was quite uncanonical. But in any event, it was illegal in the CV. But nonetheless, Wesley never left the Church of England. He, I think he said, I die as I have lived, a priest of the Church of, of England. And his brother really never left. And his brother wrote apparently thousands of hymns, thousands of hymns, especially sacramental hymns. 
But anyway, that's how the Methodist movement got started in the Church of England in the 18th century. And then during that time, um, the C of E was not doing very much about the colonies in what would become the United States. And so basically, Wesley ordained a couple of people, one of them named Thomas Koch, and the other one named Francis Asbury, and he ordained them presbyters, or ordained them as elders, or superintendents, I believe was the word, for the church in America. And so uh, that's more or less how Methodism got started in this country, but it was originally a renewal movement within, within the Church of England. So those people had uh, the, the lineage of laying on of hands then, since John Wesley ordained them. I think, I don't know whether they used the term ordained or set apart or whatever, but they were called superintendents. I think they call people in the Methodist church stewards, don't they? Well, they were called superintendents, and a superintendent is an, America, is an anglicization of an episcopus. Okay. An episcopus means an overseer okay. or supervisor, someone who looks over your shoulder. They used to be the Methodist Episcopal Church, too. They were the, and that See, meant that they had bishops, which in, the, in England, the Methodists don't have bishops. Um, but in, the, in this country, they were called the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then in the, um, in the slavery era, they, they divided the church between South and North. And in this part of the country, it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And then they were reunited in, what, the 60s or 70s, and they, um, they became the United Methodist Church. And now they're becoming the disintegrated Methodist Church. Well, they're going through um, difficulties, but those of us who live in glass houses um, should refrain from throwing stones, um, etc. cetera. Uh, anyway, so it was originally a renewal movement, but so was John the Baptist and maybe Jesus were heading up renewal movements. But what happens is um, renewal movements are frequently unstable. Um, re renewal movements start out in one religious group and sometimes adherents find their way into another new group. And, um, and that doesn't sit well with 1 Corinthians 12 where Paul introduces for the first time the concept of the church as the body of Christ. The body of Christ has got arms and legs and eyes and a bunch of different body parts. But as Paul points out, they all make up the single body, see? So that means that you Corinthians who are fighting with each other, you're doing exactly the wrong things. So um, the, 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 the analogy of the body was a plea for unity, see? And so, uh, and in the case of the Corinthian church, it didn't work. Anyway, um, to put it another way, if you are in a movement of renewal for the church and you're talking a lot about the Holy Spirit and how great the Holy Spirit is, does the Holy Spirit bring unity or disunity into the body of Christ? If it's really the Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit divide up the church? I hope not. And if you read Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, one hope in God's call to us, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is Father of all and above all and through all and in all. So that too, in Ephesians 4, is a plea for unity. And so the Holy Spirit, as I understand the Holy Spirit, I find it very difficult to believe that the Holy Spirit is something that brings disunity to the church. And that's why I, um, have, I'm sympathetic to renewal movements, but I think what I am cautious about is sometimes people in certain renewal movements, let me not name any, but people in certain renewal movements sometimes think they are the big banana and the rest of the church maybe is not, not a banana at all. Um, and so I'm, I'm sympathetic with the goal of the renewal of the church. And in the Reformation of the 16th century, the Latin phrase that was often used was this, ecclesia semper reformanda, the church must always 
be reformed. Just because you reform the church in one century doesn't mean the church doesn't need to continue to be reformed. See? So if the church needed reform in the 16th century, as indeed it did, well, it needed it in the 13th century too. It needed it in the Middle Ages. Um, the Church of the Fathers, there was a great deal of disunity in the church. That's why they had to have the councils and the creeds. So the church always is in need of reform. And so I'm uh, skeptical about isolating one century of reform, such as the Reformation of the 16th century. I'm skeptical of making that into the be all and end all of the church. Uh, I ain't too worried about the Reformation heritage of the church because the church existed for many centuries before the Reformation and was indeed the church. So the real deal is, if we're reforming the church, let's reform the church, let's not try to create a new church. See, And that's the trouble with reform movements and renewal movements is that they sometimes try to create new churches and uh, I'm not in fact in favor of that. But wasn't the Reformation a lot about the way the government of the church or the way that it was run, not necessarily it's theologically? It was very different theologically too. Um, certainly the uh, in the 16, in uh, Luther um, the Augsburg Confession says we prefer the traditional polity of the church with bishops and archbishops and all of that. And a pr the problem in Germany is they could not get a single bishop to go along with the Reformation. So Luther and other presbyters started ordaining priests because they couldn't get any bishops to go along with the Reformation. However, they did in Denmark and they certainly did in England, see? And so, um, Part of the time, uh, it, Lutherans have not always had bishops. Um, and then um, for a while they were called presidents or district presidents or something. And then um, the ELCA that we are in full communion with certainly does have bishops. And every time that we have a consecration of a bishop, an ELCA bishop is supposed to be there. And every time they have the consecration of a bishop, a bishop in the historic succession is supposed to be there and lay on hands. And of course, the Church of Sweden never lost the episcopate. The Church of Sweden always continued to have bishops. Um, and so uh, they're a Reformation church, they're a Lutheran church, and they never didn't have bishops, see. So their thinking about bishops evolved a lot in the, in the 80s. And their thinking of bishop, about bishops did evolve and then we had the Lutheran Episcopal Dialogues 1, 2, and 3, and as a result of LED 3, we entered into a full communion agreement with the, the ELCA in the year 2000. And we voted positively on it in 1997. I was there in Philadelphia. So, um, it was both the practice of the administration of the church, but it was also theology as well. Um, uh, and how many sacraments are there and how do the sacraments work um, and so there were a bunch of different aspects of the Reformation not just administ not just church government um, and so if anytime you want the church to be reformed I think we ought to always pray Lord renew your church beginning with me um, and so I am cautious about any renewal movement, including those in the Episcopal Church or any church. I'm very cautious because I want to know in way, about the ways in which Scripture is understood and used. I don't feel that I want to become a biblical literalist, and I never will become a biblical literalist or a fundamentalist. I want nothing to do with fundamentalism. Um, here in the South, most of us are converts to the Episcopal Church, and many of us are converts from church, from churches in which fundamentalism was the order of the day. And we want nothing to do with that in this church. Um, I'm also interested in the ways in which authority is being exercised in the church. Yeah, there is legitimate authority in the church, and I want to know how that authority is being exercised. Um, 
And I also am very interested in the relationships between those who are renewed by renewal movements and the wider church that's not a part of that renewal movement because it is the wider church together which is the body of Christ. It's not just one renewal movement or one group within the church that is the body of Christ and the rest of the church is not the body of Christ, but all of the church is the body of Christ. And I think one always needs to remember that. And so, um, the, in my humble opinion, there is more cautious, more caution is needed. Um, what is being claimed to be the work of the Holy Spirit? What is claimed, who is claimed to have the Holy Spirit and who is claimed perhaps not to have the Holy Spirit? And if you claim that some other Christian doesn't have the Holy Spirit, then you are in conflict with Romans 8, okay? And you're in conflict with Galatians. And what I want to know is what any renewal movement contributes to the mission of the church overall. So on the whole, renewal movements have contributed a great deal of the history of Christianity, including Methodism. Uh, and renewal movements have contributed a great deal to the particular history of Anglicanism in this country, particularly the high church renewal movement that was called the Oxford Movement. Renewal movements are also still attractive to many people, and some renewal movements can and do lead some people to a more vital and focused Christian faith and practice. Some people really get fired up about the church through their experience in the renewal movement, and I'm, I'm fine with that. I like that idea. And so, um, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, Remember that the Holy Spirit is identified with the spirit of truth in John 14. And then the church is also based on God's revelation of truth. And therefore, in my belief, the church has nothing to fear from the spirit of truth. If you're telling the truth, even though sometimes the truth makes some people uncomfortable, um, if it's the truth, it needs to be told. There is the traditional thing about Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And some of us retranslate that as, you shall know the truth and the church shall make you mad. Um, you can talk to parish priests about that one. Um, and then I think I missed a couple of slides here. Uh, the renewal movement with which some of us are familiar, we might not even know this, is that the Oxford Movement was a movement in the 19th century with Edward Bovary Pusey and John Henry Newman at Oxford. And it was a Catholic and sacramental movement within the Church of England. Um, and uh, the Oxford Movement tried to pick up some of the things that were sort of left behind in the more, in the, in the Reformation. And so they tried to bring things back. They tried to do things like wearing colored vestments. Oh my God. You know, wearing colored stoles. Um, even wearing surplices. There used to be surplus riots because people were only supposed to wear, clergy were only supposed to wear a black gown. Um, the, so there were surplus riots and colored stoles were considered high church. Uh, having a cross on the altar was considered high church. Having candles on the altar was considered unbelievably high church. And so finally, Newman got his belly full of that um, with the persecution in the C of E, and so he was received into the Roman Catholic Church. And in 1879, he was made a cardinal, and more recently, he was made a saint. Um, but anyway, most of the leaders of the, of the Oxford movement stayed in the Church of England. And the Oxford movement was a little bit more influential in the Episcopal Church than it was in the C of E, I have been told. Um, and several seminaries were very influenced by the Oxford movement and what has often been called high churchmanship. Um, General Seminary was um, broad churchmanship, perhaps leaning toward the high church in New York City. And then my seminary, which is Seabury Western, well, um, there was a low church seminary in Minnesota. Bishop Whipple wanted to have a university just for the Indians. And so he created the Bishop Seabury University and Seabury Divinity School, and it was decidedly not high church. 
And then they were in bad shape because of the Depression, and so they merged in 1933, Seabury, which was low church, and Western, which was very high church. Western was the first seminary of the Episcopal Church to have a daily celebration of the Eucharist. And so they merged in 1933, and the first class graduated in 1934. Um, and uh, then uh, Neshota House was very, very high church and still is. And so these three seminaries were direct results uh, of the American appropriation of the Oxford movement. So the higher church you get, the closer to Catholicism you get. You're in it. Yeah. You're in it. You're in it. If you are, if you are celebrating the sacraments, you're in, you're in the church. You're in Catholicism because the four marks of the church is that the church is one, the church is holy, meaning it has the Holy Spirit, the church is Catholic, not sectarian, and the church is apostolic. So basically, it's not a matter of the church thinking it's Catholic, it's a matter of the church practicing Christianity. And the church being, um, practicing Christianity means that you're actively involved in preaching the word and celebrating the sacraments. So it's a balance between word and sacraments. That's a very Anglican thing right there, is word and sacraments not just word alone. And in that we differ with some people. Um, so, um, you know, the church is not perfect and nobody knows that better than a priest and especially a priest who has been ordained for more than 40 years. Um, the church is not perfect, but that means that where the church is not like it ought to be, that means that we need to work and pray but especially work to make the church like it ought to be. Um, and that, I mean, that's why we have diocesan conventions every year. That's why the bishops have the Lambeth Conference approximately every 10 years. That's why we have the general convention of this church, which is the highest decision-making body of the church. It's not the bishops alone, nor the House of Deputies alone, but the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops together make the decisions for the church. And so, uh, because the Holy Spirit has been given to the whole church, and the whole church has the aspect of being Catholic, and the whole church has the aspect of being apostolic, namely, what we practice is, needs to be consistent with what the apostles believed and practiced, then that means that we can reasonably make decisions, big decisions, in and for the church. It's why local parishes have vestries. It's why, it's why in the Episcopal Church we have a constitution and canons, and then sometimes the constitution and canons need to be changed. And, uh, and we, hopefully under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, can make those changes. So um, it's not a perfect thing that we do, being the church, but it is a way of responding to what God wants us to do. And hopefully our response is a faithful response but I would not claim that it's perfect. Or, and I would not claim that it is without problems. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Please, Emily. Okay, what does that mean by high church mission? Well, that term is not as current as it used to be, um, but low churchmanship are the people that uh, they didn't exactly like colored vestments for a long time. And uh, you didn't have Holy Communion every Sunday. You had Holy Communion like once a month. Or Basically, the reason you didn't have Holy Communion very often is that on the East Coast, after the, Refer after the Revolutionary War, there just weren't that many priests at all. And some churches in Virginia and other places just did not have a priest. And so they could not have communion every Sunday. And so that tradition of not having communion every Sunday but having a morning prayer service, which a lay person can lead, a lay reader, um, that became the tradition that people were very loyal to that tradition. And then after World War II, after World War II, it became more common to have Holy Communion in many churches every Sunday or maybe about every other Sunday. 
In many Episcopal churches, you didn't have Holy Communion every Sunday at the late service, the main service, but you would have an eight o'clock service and you'd have Holy Communion every Sunday for those who wanted to receive communion every Sunday. See, that was the original reason for eight o'clock services. And you used not to eat before you went for communion. Right, that was never in the canons and that's never been in the Book of Common Prayer, was but that was, the, that was the tradition, practice, that you yeah. receive communion fasting. Yes. Now, if you're old like me or you're diabetic like me, those rules never apply, but those rules don't really exist. Um, a rule like that, that about communion fasting makes a lot of sense if you have communion as your early, ser at an early service in the morning. And I used to cover my head when I went to chapel at LSU. Yes. We had a little, oh really? Yeah. Chapel caps. Oh, yeah. And uh, men like me used to refer to them as doilies. But um, that was based on a misunderstanding of 1 Corinthians 11. They thought that cover, women covering their heads was with a hat or a chapel cap. And we now believe that covering the head for women has to do with hairstyles. Um, and that men should have short hair and women should have long hair and they covered their head with hair. And to quote my beloved teacher, Robert Jewett, that was the flakiest thing that Paul ever argued is 1 Corinthians 11. Um, but uh, in any event, in any event, high churchmanship was characterized by colored vestments, wearing chasubles and incense. coats, incense, the beretta, if you happen to be a priest, uh -huh. um, uh, wearing albs and colored stoles. It used to be very, very high church to wear a colored stole. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you would wear would be a cassock and surplice and a colored stole. And that was it. And now we wear, we wear it all. We wear chasubles, we wear copes. Um, I have worn a humeral veil. I've done benediction of the Blessed Sacrament in the Diocese of Chicago. Um, I wear a four-wing beretta. Um, and I wear that fourth wing and a red pom-pom because I have a doctorate in theology, see? And uh, so that's, that's very high church. And so the low churchmen, the low churchmen are very suspicious of anything that looks a little too Catholic. Um, and in the United States, there used to be a lot of anti. In the United States, there used to be a great deal of anti-Catholic prejudice, all over the United States. Yeah. Oh yeah, I grew up in a community that was like that. Right, right. We had, you know, of course, when I grew up in in the state, and I'm sure Lou too. We in, in the public schools, we had to fish on Friday to come to the Catholic. Yes, we but had that. That was South Louisiana. You could, there was the Catholics where I grew up were not. They had small church. Were, yes. You know, well, we had you fish on. I got news for you. I, I went to a Methodist college in Arkansas called Hendricks, and we had fish on Friday. Yeah. But we had fried chicken on Wednesdays. But anyway. Um, but yeah, I know all about that. But. Um, uh, I think what's happening is that the Protestant churches, like the Methodists and Presbyterians, they're starting to wear colored stoles and albs and such like that. Uh, some of the Lutherans... And blue jeans on your with cowboy boots. Yeah, I could do without that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, it, that has to do rather more with clothing styles than it does with theology. Uh, some people think that vestments were originally clothes. There was a style of clothing, and then the clothing style changed, and the clergy didn't change. Um, so, well, there... I, I grew up in a Methodist church. We never had an Advent candle in that church. We never had a hanging of the greens. We never had any of that stuff. And I'm talking about the old church that was downtown, in the corner of Dixie down there. Right, now, which my grandfather they, designed. Yeah, but now they do all of the things that we do, you know. It's just amazing. They bring uh, the sacraments down. Somebody bakes bread and brings it down to the altar now. Oh, really? just, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And even the Baptists have communion, holy communion once a month. Well, there are different ways of doing Christianity. And um, the point of preaching the word and as far as I'm concerned, teaching the word and the point of celebrating the sacraments is to make us 
more knowledgeable and better Christians, you know, more effective Christians. And that's what we need to be doing. I don't think that there's a perfect way of doing it. I can tell you there's no perfect way to train clergy. And there, we know that there's no perfect way to quote unquote deploy clergy. <laughs> deploy, deploy being a military term. Yes. yes. So there's no perfect way of doing it. And so um, we have to try to discern what the best thing is and make decisions. Okay, next Sunday we will talk about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Thank you. Thank you.